Um, when Pastor Mark called on Thursday and asked me if, if I could possibly fill in for him this morning, I, I told him that was fine. As you guys, some of you know me, I'm Jeff Sullivan. Um, you guys have seen me around quite a bit the last uh, seven or eight months, and I was finishing up my, my schooling through the PFWB and, and uh, finished that up in December and was ordained in December. Um, and that process is, is over, but I asked them if I could continue to stay here. And Mark was so so uh, happy to grant me that, so I get to stay on with you guys and, and get to stay under Mark's tutelage, and, and I appreciate him for that, and I appreciate the church for having us and for allowing us to be here the last six or seven months. And, and Bobby and I just felt that there were some things still here that that we could do and that we wanted to help with and and that's why we've continued on to stay so uh, when mark called and asked me if i could i i told him i said that was fine and i kind of stopped what i was doing and went to work on on um you know preparing something for today and something i realized uh maybe friday afternoon i guess that was thursday about 4 30 and friday about 4 30 um, I had worked on it all night Thursday night and most of the day on Friday. And then I realized that I was pushing and that it was I, that I was trying to bring a message for you guys. And God spoke to me and said, you know, that, that you've worked on the last 24 hours, uh, you're going to scrap that. And you're just going to throw that away. And this is the message that I want you to deliver on Sunday. So at 4.30, I text PM and I said, hey, listen, you know, you asked me to do that and I've been working on that for 24 hours and I've just thrown it in the garbage. And he sent me a little frowny face back and he said, huh? And I said, yeah, I just threw that in the garbage and, and um, I was pushing that and it was me and, and I just wanted to let you know that I have started working on something else, and I'll get it to you as quickly as possible, but it's probably going to be tomorrow. And he said, well, okay, that's fine, you know, and, and he said, get it to me as quickly as you can. But So anyways, I sent it to him uh, on Saturday. I think I finished it up mid-morning on, on Saturday and sent it over to him, and, and he said that was fine, you know, and, and sent it. But um, what I wanted to talk to you about this morning, I, I wanted to tell you a little bit about me first. I grew up playing sports my entire life, and, and most, uh, if I weren't playing sports, I was at some sort of sports function, or, or um, sports just had a big, big part of my life growing up. Um, as I continued to get older, um, when I graduated, um, I started coaching, and that just seemed to fit because I had played sports, you know, forever, so I started coaching. And then, of course, I had children, and my children started playing sports. And it just become kind of part of our life, you know, as a, as a coach. If any of you played sports or if you coached, it's just something that it just kind of stays with you forever. And I started thinking about the things that I had learned through sports and the things that it had taught me. And some of those things that it had taught me was, of course, sportsmanship, you know, is one of the first things that you learn. And... It, it helps develop us, if you will. And I feel like, you know, because it's generated as a team, you know, effort that you can't really rely on yourself. You've got to rely on, you know, your team. You can't do it. There's, you hear the phrase, there's no I in team, and there's not, you know. And, and you have to learn that you can't do it by yourself, and you've got to kind of depend on the others that are around you. It'll teach you respect. It'll teach you respect in several aspects because you learn to respect the game that you're playing. You learn to respect the other people that you're playing the game with. Um, if you ever had some of the coaches like I had, um, I played uh, summer baseball and legion ball for uh, Dole Whitfield at Southern Wayne. If any of you know Dole Whitfield ever, uh, he loved to run his players. When I say he loved to run his players, he loved to run his players to death. We would, we would, he said, you're going to be the most physical fit team that there is. He said, if anything else, you might not be able to win the game, but you're going to outlast them. And he believed in that. But we learned to respect our coaches and 
um, it brought about a sense of unselfishness for us that, you know, one player may be able to score 60 points a game, but if you get beat 61 to 60, then what does it matter? You know, you've lost. And it teaches us to be accountability, you know, that accountability that we had to have not only for ourselves, but we had to have accountability to one another. It taught us patience uh, to be able to, to work with one another in a way that, you know, I may not understand the way Gene plays basketball, and Gene may not understand the way I play basketball, but if we kind of take that patience for one another and, and start to understand, then we can play together, you know, and, and that team mentality kind of comes back around. So what God laid on my heart Friday afternoon was with everything we had going on in the world, and then I had in the back of my mind, of course, you know, quite a few of our people had come back from the conference and they were sick and not feeling well, um, was a playbook, if you will. As a coach, when I coached, we would watch film of other teams. We would go. I, I can't tell you how many games I've actually gone to and just sat and watched another team play that we were going to play in a week or two weeks or three weeks. And you have to have that playbook put together to be able to, to have a better opportunity to win. So I sat down and I come up with these five points, if you will, of a playbook, if you will, to victory. So the first one that I had sat down and come up with was that, you know, we've got to prepare ourselves. And, of course, in sports, we prepared ourselves with, you know, countless hours and days and weeks of practice, and, and that was how we prepared ourselves. And I said, well, for us, you know, as Christians and, and our day-to-day -day lives and our walk, you know, we've got to prepare ourselves with something, so we prepare ourselves with prayer most of the time. And in Philippians 4, 6, it tells us, it says, we should not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let our request be made known to God. And I told Bobby, I said, you know, I've always wanted, some of you guys are going to not remember this at all, but others are going to say, what is he doing? Mark's probably going to say it too. I've always wanted to be able to reference MC Hammer when I stood behind the pulpit, and I finally had an opportunity that I said, you know what? I can, I can actually reference M.C. Hammer today. M.C. Hammer sang a song, and some of you guys might not even know who he is, but he sang a song that said, we've got to pray. And it was, we've got to pray today. We've got to pray every single day. And, and it holds true because, you know, where are we without prayer in our lives? You know, each of us, you know, we go through different things every day in our life. And we have others that surround us, our family and our friends, that they're going through things. And oftentimes, you know, we talk about those things with one another. And, and the simplest thing that we can do, but the most important thing, is pray. And it's not only praying, you know, for the things that we have going on in our lives, but praying for others. You know, we talk about it here openly, and we took prayer requests, and, and we want to have that time that we go to God and that we give it all to God and that we give it all to God in prayer and that we not only thank God for the things that he's doing in our lives but just where we're at in general and the things that we know that others need help with and, and how we can be important to those people that actually need us and what we can do to change things in other people's lives that they may need. So that prayer is, is so important. Um, it talks about in Isaiah 63, 7, it says, uh, recounting the steadfast love um, in the, it, here it is. It says, I will recount the steadfast love of the Lord, the praises of the Lord, according to all that the Lord has granted us, the great goodness to the house of Israel that he has granted them according to his compassion, according to the abundance of his steadfast love. You know, we serve a compassionate God, a loving God. And it says it there. It says, you know, God's abundance of his steadfast love. And I think, you know, we fail to remember that so many times that the easiest thing that we can do to make God happy is to go to him with prayer. And it's something so, like I said, so small but so important 
that we forget. There's times that Bobby and I, you know, we try to make a point that we pray every morning and that we pray every night before we go to bed. And there's times that I know, you know, we'll get up late and, you know, the kids hadn't took showers the night before and we're trying to get them ready for school. And next thing you know, we shuffle out and, man, we forgot to pray, you know. I feel like that probably saddens Christ in a way because we've not gone to him that morning to start our day. How can I start my day without prayer? When I was coaching and went back into the public school system to coach, um, the public school system, I won't say necessarily frowned upon prayer, but it wasn't anything that most of these kids ever did. So the first time I said, okay, guys, huddle up. We're going to say the Lord's Prayer. And they said, the Lord's what? Some of the kids had never even heard the Lord's Prayer before. You know, growing up in a Christian school the way I did, that was something I heard, you know, by the time I was five or six years old, I could probably recite the Lord's Prayer. But these kids, you know, they didn't. So it was great to be able to coach in the public school system and to be able to bring that back in. Um, Fellowship of Christian Athletes was a big deal for me and I would have them come out and talk to our group and talk to our kids because of, of the importance that I felt that it had to have, the kids had to have prayer. You know, they had to learn these things that, that you know, what it meant to be a team and, you know, how we overcome obstacles was with prayer. So the second point that I wanted to bring to you today was We've got to prepare ourselves for battle. And that, you know, that preparation that we had for us, I was a soccer coach for many years and played soccer. Um, we wore shin guards. You know, all the football players said, yeah, you guys are a bunch of, you know, little little girls and, and all you wear is these little shin guards. And, and uh, you know, we're wearing shoulder pads and stuff. You know, that's, that's what we wear. And, you know, but everybody wore something different, you know. But that was part of their their armor, if you will. And I thought about the, the scripture that says in Ephesians 6, 10, and 11, it says, Finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. You know, the whole armor of God, I, I, I read into that a little bit, and I thought, you know, you think of that, you know, the whole armor being, you know, I, Bobby and I watched uh, the movie Troy the other night, and, you know, you see those guys going into battle and they're putting on a breastplate, they're putting on a helmet. And, you know, you, you think about that. And for us, you know, the full armor of God really should be our trust in the Lord. Wouldn't you agree? That that trust that we should have in Christ and what Christ has done for us and done in our lives, that's that armor of God that we, that we put on each day. I don't think there's anybody here that couldn't say at some point in your life, you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God made a difference in your life. That there was something that you can say, oh, that had to have been God. I know that without a shadow of a doubt, that was God. I remember one time I was in the car business for many years, and I kind of got hurting in my back, my lower back. It was excruciating pain, terrible. So I was going to walk over from, I worked at the Volkswagen and Mazda store. I was going to walk over from the Mazda side over to the Volkswagen side, and I was walking about halfway over and just buckled to my knees in pain. It was excruciating. Beads of sweat, you know, on my forehead, huge. I told him, I said, guys, I've got to leave. I've got to go. I'm going to have to go to the immediate care or go somewhere. So I did, and I went, and Dr. Uh, Bateman was there, and, and he was a family doctor of ours, remember me, and, and I was just bouncing off the walls. He said, Jeff, what is it? I said, I don't know, Doc. I said, I'm in terrible pain, and he kind of laughed. I said, what are you laughing at? He said, I think I know what you've got. I said, what is it? It's terrible. I can't, you know, I can't, can't handle it. He said, I, I think you've got a kidney stone there. I said, oh, my goodness, I've heard terrible things. He said, well, I'm going to give you a shot, you know, and, and I'll send you over for an ultrasound. So he did. He sent me over for an ultrasound, and, and uh, I was over there still in terrible pain. They sent me back to him. I got another shot. 
he gave me some, some pills to take home with me, and that was on a Friday. And he said, listen, take these through the weekend. You know, he gave me this little strainer that, you know, I was supposed to use. And he said, you know, maybe, you know, you're going to, you know, pass it. But I doubt it. It was a seven millimeter kidney stone. It's huge. And he said, you know, it's there in a turn, you know, you're probably just going to be in a lot of pain all weekend long. I thought, great, this is wonderful, you know. So Sunday came and I, you know, I said, well, I, I definitely want to go to church, but I was in so much pain. I went ahead and went to church anyways. And had taken one of my pain pills that morning and still suffering in terrible pain. The pastor was, was, was preaching and he was in the middle of his sermon and I was sitting dead center. I remember it so well. And it was like someone from behind me grabbed my top of my jacket and picked me up. So I stood right up in the middle of service. Which is a little awkward because people will tend to look at you if you just stand up for no reason and stand there. Which is what I did. And then God proceeded to move my feet to the altar which will also get you looks while the pastor's preaching if you just walk up to the altar for no reason. Um, Ira Williford was the pastor that, that I walked up on that day, and Ira looked at me and stopped the service. And I remember him saying, you know, obviously Brother Jeff needs prayer. And he reached down and he got his anointing oil and he asked for some of the elders of the church to come down, and they did. And they prayed over me. Immediately, immediately, I had relief. Immediately. Go back, sit down. He finishes up his sermon. Monday morning, I go to the doctor on Monday morning and go in and bring my little cup and give it to him. He said, yeah, nothing. I said, listen, I need to tell you, I don't have a kidney stone any longer. He said, oh, you passed it. I said, well, kind of. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, I went to church yesterday. God picked me up, went to the altar, got prayed on, hands. Kidney stone's gone. He was not a believer of any kind. He said, okay, great. We're going to send you over for an ultrasound. You know, we'll schedule you for surgery. So they send me over for an ultrasound. The girl comes back in the room and she's, what are you here for again? I said, well, I was supposed to be here for a kidney stone. I said, but I don't have a kidney stone, do I? She said, no, you don't have a kidney stone. She said, so why are you here? I said, well, the doctor wanted me to come over and, you know, I explained the story. My point in all of that was at that time in my life, I needed a definite answer. I needed it for me. There was things in my life that I was questioning. I was questioning God. I knew about the armor of God that I should be putting on, and I tried to put it on every single day. But there were things that I lacked in. I didn't want to fully commit. I just wanted to be a little bit in the water, right? That was it for me. That was my defining moment. That was it for me. Now, it may be different in everybody, but that was that mark in my life that I will always remember that I knew. God may not give that to you. He may have already given it to you. But we have to do what it says. We have to put on that full armor of God every single day we have to put it on. You know, I know that now looking back that that was just that what God wanted me to have to give me that assurance that I need them. Point three for me in doing this was asking God for God's wisdom. When we coach, you know, we would sit down with one another, other coaches, and I would say, hey, what do you know about that team? And they would tell me, and we would talk about it. I had friends of mine that coached that I would call and say, hey, you coach, you know, you played these guys. Tell me about this team, and who do I need to look out for? And we would just help each other all we could. Um, 
James 1, 1 through 5 says, James, a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes of dispersion. Greetings. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Go back to that one scripture, if you will, for one second. Because I want to talk about that for a minute. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. That's probably got to be one of the most difficult things that we could do. I don't know any of us, when we actually meet trials in our lives, where we say, yes, man, I can't wait to have another one of those trials. But what does it teach us, right? I always tell the kids, you know, the equal and opposite reaction, you know, whatever you do is going to have some sort of reaction. Just remember that. You know, for us, if we looked at trials in our life with that expectation of joy, if you will, then it, we don't have to fear having trials. I think that's so much what we get into often is the fear of what's going to be. You know, the fear of COVID. You know, if you don't believe for a minute that you can be fearful about something, turn on the news tonight and sit down for an hour and watch the news. You won't want to go out of the house. You won't want to leave your living room. It'll scare you so bad. Turn it on tomorrow morning and watch it for an hour. There is no good news. It's all bad news. That's all they want to do. It's just create that hype, you know, that they want created. Because what does it do? It gives them better ratings, sells more news, right? Go on to the next scripture, if you will. It says, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. I love that word, steadfastness. You don't hear that used every single day. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. That word steadfastness, I, I looked at it for a minute, you know, what does it mean? You know, what is it? It means, you know, to be unwavering in something. You know, to be, you know, as firm in something as we can possibly be. If you'll go to the next verse. It says, if any of us lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach. And it will be given to him. It's another word, reproach, that you don't see used every single day. You know, that was one that, if you think about that word, you know, reproach, what, what the meaning of it is, is without disappointment. So change it. Who gives generously to all without disappointment. If you lack wisdom, ask God who gives to you without disappointment. God's telling us, come to me, ask me, I'll give it to you. I'm not going to be disappointed in you at all. It was just like coaching. Coach, I don't understand how to do this. Come to me, ask me, let me help you with it. That's what we should do for one another. I don't understand this going on in my life right now. Have you ever experienced it? I don't understand why this is going on at work right now. Gene, have you ever, could you tell me, could you help me with it? You know, why is it that we are oftentimes afraid to come to each other with things that we have going on in our lives? We're the body. We're the body of Christ. We should come to each other. Certainly carry it to God. God tells us, I'm not going to be disappointed in you. But sometimes we feel like the sin that we have is greater than God. It's not. It's not greater than God. There's nothing greater than God. So we need to be able to give him that. Know that we can go and carry it to him. And there's not going to be any disappointment there. The fourth point is the accountability of it all. I mentioned it earlier, 
when I talked about what sports had given us, the accountability of confessing our sins because there has to be some accountability for it. Just like I said to the kids, if you do something wrong, we need to discuss it. There might be punishment, there may not be, but we've got to discuss about that accountability for it. I had made a note here that said, we fall short each day. We fall short in every aspect of our life at times. And faithfulness is one thing that we're promised. And we are promised that. I think it tells us in the book of John, 1 John. It talks about God's faithfulness to us. You know, God just told us in that previous statement that he was going to not be disappointed in us. And then he goes on in 1 John and he talks about his faithfulness to us. God's going to be faithful to us if we carry it to him and give it to him. And it's everything, not just part of it, everything we have to give to him. James 5, 16 says, Therefore confess your sins to one another, to pray for one another, that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power at his working. Do you believe that? Because if you don't believe it, it doesn't matter. You've got to believe that verse. The prayer of a righteous person has great power. I want you... I, I, I grew up listening to all sorts of music. Bobby loves some of the, the older music that I listened to. But I listened to... There was a group called the Ernie Haas Band. And the Ernie Haas Band... Uh, sang a song that was called Pray For Me and I'd love to sing it I sing it to the top of my lungs in the shower and you know the words of that song you know pray for me when I'm lonely pray for me when I'm sad pray for me when I need you pray for me you know I want you to pray for me church pray for me and I want to pray for you I want to do the same thing for you we should all have that time. We should have time that we just come to the altar and just pray. You know, the doors ought to be open 24 hours a day. Come on in. Come pray. But you don't have to do it here. You can do it at home. You can get in a prayer closet. You can do it in the car on the way to work. You can do it with your wife or husband every morning. You can do it wherever. But I want people to pray for me. I want that accountability to you. We've got an accountability to Christ, don't we? Well, I want to have accountability to each other. Why shouldn't we have accountability to each other? But we fear that sometimes. My point five is obtaining God's victory. I feel like that this is probably one of the easiest points, this last point. Because when we're, we're playing sports and we're playing different teams, there was always a question of whether or not we would win, right? You don't know. It's a 50-50 shot you're going into. You may be able to beat your opponent. You may not be able to beat your opponent. But I feel like for the victory of this, that it's really already, in a sense, been won. Amen? Why has it been won? Because look what he did for us. Look at those stripes down his back. Look at the blood that he shed. Look at what he did for you and for me. Wow. Woo. Preach. First Corinthians fifteen fifty seven says, But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
The battle has been won. Believe it. One of my old favorite hymns, if you will, was Victory in Jesus. I would sing it for you, but you guys probably don't want to hear that. Victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath his cleansing blood. Church, the victory has already been won. All we have to do is to put our little playbook together, go through these five things, and just admit our sins to Christ and ask for his forgiveness. Church, stand with me. I always feel like I'm remiss if I don't offer this, and I always do. It may be a downfall of mine, or it may not be a downfall of mine. But I always feel like it needs to be offered. Your altar is open. If you choose to come down and pray, you are more than welcome to come down and pray. I certainly feel like we have a lot to pray about. We have a new year that God brought us into. The things in the past is just that. The reason the rearview mirror is small and the windshield is so large is because. We want the things in the past to be just that, things in the past. We've got a great big broad windshield to look through and a lot to do in 2022. So let it be in the past. If you want to come to the altar and pray, you're more than welcome to. The altar is open. If everyone will keep each one of the individuals that are in our body in prayer, that are sick the ones at Stony Creek that have come back that are sick I said that I was not going to touch on COVID a whole lot and I didn't it's real it's a thing but it's not a thing that's any bigger than Christ because nothing is bigger than Christ I'm going to let her play for just a second. You guys just take a minute. Everyone can just bow your heads and close your eyes. If anyone wants to come to the altar, the altar is open. If there's anybody here that don't know Christ as their personal Savior, I want to give you that opportunity right now. Just quietly, just lift your hand up. It is life changing, life altering. It is by far the best decision that you will ever make in your life.
Georgia, right? Gainesville, Georgia. So we've got a, a, a big move church family that's going on, and it's going to be a new job, and it's going to be a move to Georgia that's going to be a, a pretty, pretty big deal as well. And I just want the church, for the church just to extend a hand real quick, and let's just pray over him, you know, and, and that God's going to give him the traveling mercies that he needs and that hedge of protection around him and that we just each as a body and body just pray out loud and just pray for him if you will. Church, I thank you for being here today. I thank you for the opportunity of being able to fill in for Pastor Mark. And I think everything is going to resume on Wednesday night, I believe. And you guys will um, will see that in the, uh, the bulletins and stuff that's coming up for the rest of the week. You guys enjoy your day. Thank you, and everyone have a safe week this week.